Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Expect the Best, how to get the most out of your hospice care. I'm Calvin Hu, the Education Coordinator at Family Caregiver Alliance and your host for today. Um, for four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. And we offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, retreats, publications, and advocacy. To learn more about FCA or access our online resource center, CareNav, please visit us at caregiver.org. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on your screen. Your phones or microphones are going to be muted. And we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We'll also be asking you to give a little bit of feedback uh, at the end, and we'd like to uh, thank you all in advance for filling that out. Finally, the, our, the webinar will be archived and we'll also have the slides available. So if you have to um, leave early or if you'd like to um, come back for reference, we'll have that available uh, a little later on. So today I'd like to welcome our guests, Helen Bauer and Jerry Finter. Helen has a 30 year history in nursing, specializing in hospice care for over 10 years. She holds a certification in hospice and palliative care nursing and currently works as an independent hospice consultant. Helen is the co-owner of the Heart of Hospice LLC and is one of the hosts of the Heart of Hospice podcast, which is kind of committed to enhancing the end of life journey for both uh, members of the public and also providers of hospice care. Our second presenter is Jerry Fenter. Uh, he has more than 10 years experience in hospice chaplaincy he currently works as system director of spiritual counselors for Harbor Healthcare System, which is a multi-site hospice company. He holds certificates for basic and advanced hospice and palliative care chaplaincy from the Institute for Palliative Care at California State University in San Marcos. Jerry is the co-owner of the Heart of Hospice and also the co-host of the Heart of Hospice podcast. So now that, you know, now that you know a little bit more about today's uh, presenters, I'd like to turn things over to Helen and Jerry. Thank you, Calvin. This is Helen. I'm gonna get us started. Um, welcome to Expect the Best, how to get the most out of your hospice care. We're gonna jump right into our objectives today. We have four things we're gonna focus on. Um, we're going to describe the hospice philosophy and the approach to care that hospice has. We're going to be debunking those myths and misinformation that you can hear about end of life care. We're also hoping that you gain information about the rights of the patient and their caregivers or decision makers. And lastly, we're going to define the members of the hospice interdisciplinary team and then talk about the role of each one of those folks. Next slide. 80% of Americans prefer to die at home. This is why you need to know about hospice. 80% prefer to die at home, but only 20% actually do. And how can we change those numbers? Hospice teams can support seriously ill people who wanna die at home and support their caregivers as well. For every one hospice patient, according to the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, there are two more patients who could benefit from hospice care. One of the saddest things that hospice professionals like Jerry and I hear are families who tell us, I wish we had known about hospice sooner, or I wish we had called hospice earlier. So our goal for you guys today is to increase your knowledge about hospice so you'll have what you need when you need it, when it's your turn to make a decision about end of life care for your loved one or for yourself, or to advise someone in your care who's a caregiver. Um, hospice care is often underutilized because it's misunderstood. So that's really our, our mission and our focus today. So next slide, please. We're gonna jump into the hospice myths and misinformation, first thing. First myth we have is hospice is just for the last few days of life. <clears throat> That's not true. The fact is that hospice is for anyone with a limited life expectancy of six months or less as decided by their physician, right? Um, second myth is hospice is only for cancer patients. 
The fact is hospice patients have a wide variety of diagnoses. We see end of life patients with respiratory illnesses like COPD and emphysema, heart disease like congestive heart failure and CAD, um, kidney failure, ESRD, um, neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, um, dementias, things like that. Um, one of the facts that we know about hospice being underutilized in the United States is 28% of the patients on hospice receive service for less than one week at a time, one week before they pass away on our service. Surveys of families about their hospice experience show that more time in hospice or an earlier referral to hospice improves that end of life experience with hospice care. It just enables our hospice teams to provide better care for our patients. Next slide, please. So another myth is a patient on hospice can never come off of hospice. No, that's not true. The fact is the patient or patient's representative can choose to cancel hospice care and to seek treatment. They can choose to return to hospice at a later time if the patient still meets the criteria for hospice care. Another myth is that hospice is a place. You'll hear people say, oh, you know, they sent Mr. So-and-so to hospice. But the fact is hospice is a philosophy. It's not a place. It's a type of care. Most hospice patients receive care in private homes, nursing homes, or assisted living facilities. About 98% of our patients receive care out in their homes, whatever they call home. Next slide, please. So our next myth is hospice agencies require the patient to have a do not resuscitate document. A do not resuscitate document or order is a document that says that the patient doesn't want to have chest compressions, CPR, any type of artificial ventilation. But the fact is that not all hospice patients have a DNR. You don't have to have one. It's the patient's choice whether they have a document like that or not. Now, there are certain hospice agencies that require a patient on their particular care, on their, um, in that agency's care to have a DNR, but that's not widely utilized. So it is the patient's choice. Um, another, myth, uh, another myth is that hospice hastens death. Hospice philosophy never seeks to hasten death. We also don't prolong life. It, it's, um, we're about respecting the body and conserving quality of life, improving quality of life for patients as their body moves through the disease trajectory. Next slide. I'm going to turn this section over to Jerry. One of the things we wanted to do in this presentation was to help you find a hospice agency that's a good fit. And so choosing a hospice agency is a very important decision that either the patient or the caregiver will have to make. And so we want to help you to do that, uh, we have some, some things that we'd like to offer to you, some recommendations. First of all, if you have the available time, it would be good to interview three or four hospice agencies in the area where the service is needed. Now, there's not a doctor's order that's needed for this. You have the, the right and the privilege to call any hospice agency at any time and request an evaluation. So. It's good to interview if you, again, if the time is available to the patient. We know that in some situations, there's just not enough time. Sometimes uh, the patient is, is already in, a, um, in the dying process. And so you don't have that available time. However, if they have a six month prognosis, then it would be good to take the time to interview three or four hospice agencies. Now here in just a moment, we're going to give you some questions that you can use during the interview. Now keep in mind, all hospice agencies provide care under the same regulations and laws. Uh, all of them are going to provide the same thing all across the board because there are requirements, there's regulatory requirements that they all must meet. Therefore, they're all going to provide pretty much the same care. However, there are 
differences in hospice agencies. That's not to say that every hospice agency is the same because they're not. Uh, there are some that are for profit. There are some that are nonprofit. You have some that are very small agencies that are local. And then you have some that are very large, what we might call chain agencies. That is, they're large corporations and they have offices in many different cities. And so you might want to choose what's best for you and for your situation. You may want to have an agency that's small, uh, that's actually in the area where the service is going to be provided. And maybe you want a nonprofit. So you want to look for those. And again, there are some people who may decide that they want a larger uh, agency, one that has, you know, offers more services. If that's what you want, then certainly that's what you should look for. Now, the best way to look for an agency is, uh, of course, really word of mouth. Listen to the people who you know have used hospice services in the area where you're going to need uh, service. Search for the, those agencies. You can also use the Care Compare website. So the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services have created a website called Care Compare. If we move to the next slide, we'll show you, we'll show you there, yeah, right there. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from the Care Compare website. So when you go in, you can actually choose from several different types of, uh, of healthcare entities including uh, nursing homes, home health services, uh, long-term care, uh, rehabilitation facilities, and things like that. But there's also hospice care. So when you click on the hospice care button, you'll then be able to uh, search in the area where the care is needed. So if you're a caregiver who is searching for assistance for maybe a parent who lives a long distance away, you can actually do search and find out information about the agencies that's in the area where your loved one is living. And there on that website, there will be some information about, it's kind of a star rating, if you will. Uh, it's not, not really reviews, but the information does come from, uh, from the, um, I'm sorry, the information does come from agencies as well as the public. So you want to know that this information is there and available. Now, we wanna offer one word of caution to you. The information that's available on Care Compare is about two to three years old. So there's not any information there about agencies that might be newer than that. And it might be that things have changed within an agency within the past two or three years. So it's just good to consider that the Care Compare website is not up to date. You know, it's not like when you go to Amazon and do a search and, and you know, review a product, not quite like that because this is information is going to be a little bit older than that. So if we'll move to the next slide. So if you have the time to interview, here are some things that you want to ask when you're shopping for a hospice agency. So one of the first things you wanna ask is how many patients are in a nurse's caseload? Now, it's very important to know this and I'm, I'm gonna actually turn this over to Helen and ask her why it's good to know, you know the caseload that a nurse might have. Right, um, it's uh, the number of patients that a nurse carries that she's responsible for is called a caseload. And the number you'd like to hear from the hospice agency that you're talking to is typically between 12 and 14, 12 and 15 patients. The reason that's a good number is because it's manageable. Um, your nurse is going to be able to see you um, himself or herself. Um, if you have a nurse that's carrying a whole lot more patients than that, it usually means that other nurses are going to be making your visits um, or the nurse may not see you as frequently. So it's a good idea to know how many patients they're carrying, gives you an idea of how they manage the workload there. Okay, very good. So one of the other things you might want to ask is if any of their nurses or their medical director is certified in hospice and palliative care. So there are certifications for nurses. In fact, Helen is a uh, certified hospice and palliative care nurse. And there are doctors who have a board certification in hospice and palliative care. So it's good to ask and find out if they have any nurses on their staff 
that are certified in hospice and palliative care. So again, I'm going to ask Helen, why is it important for people to, to consider whether the, the, the nurse or the medical director is certified? The certification training that um, a nurse and a physician have to have to have that the certifications in hospice and palliative care um, are above and beyond the education they receive as part of their formal education or a medical degree, you know, a nursing degree. Um, and it's very specialized um, and it's renewed for nurses. We do it every three, four years. And there's continuing education that's required throughout those that uh, period of certification. For clinicians, you can certify LVNs, nurse practitioners, RNs. There are actually over 14,000 clinicians in the United States who are certified in hospice and palliative care. So that's not to say that um, physicians or nurses who do not have the certification do not have training. Um, they have work experience, they have training on the job, they're mentored, they have preceptors, they just haven't received formal training, formal education. So the certification is a good thing to ask about. So it would be similar to the difference between a general practitioner and a specialist? Yes. Okay. So in the interview, you will also, also want to ask, how often will a nurse, a social worker, spiritual counselor, visit a patient who is uh, stable? Let's first of all look at that consideration. So how often would they expect that a nurse would come out? For a nurse to see a patient who's stable, you would expect once to once to twice a week, one to two times a week. Okay. And so for a social worker and a spiritual counselor, generally speaking, you can uh, expect them to be coming to see the patient, the family, about once a month. Now, there may be um, reasons for them to be uh, coming and visiting more often than that, but at least a minimum, they should be there once a month. Now, when the patient is entering the dying process, which basically means they may be coming very close to death, then the, the frequency of visits begins to, to increase. Uh, so how often would a nurse come out to see a patient who is in the dying process? Typically, the nurse should be coming out every day for a patient that is in the dying process to support the family, to help manage any symptoms. Um, they would also come out as needed if the family would call, have a question, or um, the patient's condition changes. Okay. And for a social worker or a spiritual counselor, uh, they would also be coming out as much as needed. And so they, you should expect them to be there when they're needed, and they will be coming out more frequently when the patient is in the dying process. Um, one of the things that you want to consider also is whether there are disciplines that are on call. So many times, you know, the, the crises don't happen uh, on, on everybody's time frame, on everybody's time schedule. Instead, they often happen during the night, they happen on weekends or holidays. So you want to find out what disciplines of the hospice team are going to be on call. Is it just the nurse or is it going to be the nurse and the social worker and the spiritual counselor? You want to find that information out because it's very important. There should be someone on call uh, all of the time, even during holidays, weekends, evenings and nights. There should be someone to uh, someone that you can call if there's a crisis. There should always be someone available. And typically what will happen is that they will you will make a call if there's a crisis or if you've just got a question about medications or something like that. You can call. There will be a triage nurse who will take your call and then determine if it's necessary to send a nurse or a social worker or a spiritual counselor if there's a need for that. So keep in mind too, aides, the hospice aides are generally not available for on-call. Now they typically work holidays and weekends, but they're not gonna be available for on-call purposes. Another question to ask an agency if you're interviewing them is what medications and what equipment will be provided? Now, a lot of that's going to be determined by the need of the patient and what the patient uh, desires to have too. Uh, so Helen, help me out a little bit on this. When it comes to medications, how is that determined? 
medication coverage is provided by the hospice agency. Um, they are required to cover any and all medications and equipment that are related to the patient's terminal diagnosis, which is the primary diagnosis, and any contributing diagnoses as well. Um, so anything having to do with symptom management is always covered. Uh, anything having to do with pain or shortness of breath, anxiety, nausea and vomiting, agitation, all of those medications are covered. Um, but it is up to the discretion of the agency. And so that is a conversation you definitely want to have up front when you're talking to an agency. Okay. And so what about equipment? Again, it's going to be determined by the need uh, that's there. So some equipment is usually prescribed by the, the doctor and the nurse just for, for helpful reasons. Right, right. And that's sort of individualized to the patient. The agency will have a, a basic list of equipment that they supply, um, like a um, hospital bed, an overbed table, a wheelchair or a walker, um, an oxygen tank, a suction machine, things like that. Any kind of specialized needs that a patient might have, say a high-backed wheelchair for an Alzheimer's or dementia patient who can't hold themselves upright, or a Broda chair, which is like a padded um, recliner that is on wheels, that would be something that would be above and beyond, and you would have to ask the agency if they would make that available for you. Okay. One thing to keep in mind, too, um, starting back in October of last year, uh, hospice agencies were required, if, if it was requested by the patient or the family, to let the patient and the family know what medications and equipment they would not supply. And so it's good to know that information. If, uh, if you want to know what they will supply and what they won't supply, you simply have to ask, and they are required to provide you with what's called an addendum and to let you know about that. Now, in hospice, the people who are providing care are humans. They are not robots, and sometimes mistakes are made, or sometimes things are not handled properly. So you want to ask, how are complaints handled? Uh, this is very important because, again, you're working with humans who sometimes will make mistakes. You want to know what process and what is the procedure that they will go through if there is a complaint, uh, because sometimes there are. And I'll be honest, it doesn't happen often, but there are those moments when things just don't go the way that they should, and so it's good to know how the agency will handle a complaint. Okay, next slide. Okay, another question that is good to ask in an interview is if the agency is accredited. So there are many accrediting agencies out there, and you're probably more familiar with the agencies that accredit hospitals and nursing homes. And the most common that's accrediting agency out there is Joint Commission. Uh, and Joint Commission is the one that typically will accredit many hospice agencies too. But there are other ones, including CHAP and ACHC, as well as the state organization. Maybe your health and human services organization in your state is an accrediting agency as well. So you want to ask if the agency is accredited. Now, being accredited uh, simply means that they have passed some very stringent uh, tests to make sure that their entire organization is uh, up to, to speed and up to par for that, that they're providing good quality care. And so being accredited is indeed something that's very important to know. So ask who the accrediting agency is and, um, and make sure that they are accredited. Now, it's also important that you ask if the patient or the caregiver can attend a hospice team meeting. Now, hospices, hospice teams meet uh, generally about every two weeks, every 14 to 15 days. And during those meetings, they will talk about um, the needs of the patient, if there's any changes that have been taking place that need to be uh, updated and that make sure that everyone on the team is aware of any changes that are happening. Now, at those meetings, the patient and the caregiver are allowed to attend. And that means that you would actually come in and meet with the team also. So it's possible for that to happen. The answer that you're looking for when you ask this question is yes, that you are able to attend. Um, now, Helen, there are some things about that that you, they probably need to know about as well. Sure. So, so when we sit down as um, a hospice team and um, what they call an IDT, interdisciplinary team, to discuss patients, of course, we're discussing 
a, a whole group of patients. If we have a patient or a family caregiver come in that want to be part of the meeting for their particular person, their case, of course, there are no other patients discussed but that one. And more than likely, you can expect only the core team that provides care for that patient to be present. And of course, in this day and age, um, during the pandemic, they might be re meeting remotely. So it would be possible for you to participate um, via conference call or a Zoom call. But yes, the, the patient or the family has the right to participate there. And typically the people you would find involved in an interdisciplinary team meeting would be your nurse, the social worker, the spiritual counselor, the chaplain, um, and the physician. The physician would also be involved. Yes, so the, in fact, those, those four core team members are always present at a uh, hospice team meeting. Right. So another thing that you need to know about is um, where the agency would contract for respite care. Now, respite care is a, a Medicare hospice benefit that's provided. The respite care is a time when the patient would be able to go to a facility for up to five days. And that respite care is actually for the caregiver to receive uh, a time of rest while the patient is being cared for by someone else but you wanna find out what facilities the agency is contracted with. So you wanna know, is, is the patient going to be sent to a nursing facility? Is, it, is the patient going to be sent to a hospital? Where will the patient go? Will the patient go to a, a inpatient unit that the hospice agency provides? So you want to find out where they, where they go because the facility that uh, they're sending the patient to might not be one that you want them to go to. You just need to find out. And the same is true for what's called general inpatient care. So general inpatient care is um, a level of care that provides around the clock care for a patient when the patient is in crisis. And it's just for crisis uh, care. But you also wanna ask what facilities they're contracted with for general inpatient care. <clears throat> so another question to ask the agency is how long is the, how have they been in business? Now, not that length of time necessarily means that they have a better quality of care, but it's just still something that's good to know. When it comes to on-call, you also wanna find out what is a typical response time. Now, that response time is going to vary depending on the, the area where you live or where the patient lives. Uh, maybe they're you know, living way out in the country or maybe they're living in a metropolitan area where it's, um, it's hard to get around because of traffic but the agency will be able to tell you what a typical on-call response time would be. And it's good to know that. And then finally, you want to also ask what bereavement care is provided after the patient dies. Every hospice agency is required to provide bereavement care for up to 13 months after a patient has died. And that's bereavement care for the family, for the caregivers, uh, for anyone who was within that patient's uh, circle of care. So you want to find out. Now, bereavement care can vary from agency to agency. Find out what it is that that agency will provide for you. Many provide uh, ex very um, extensive bereavement services, and then some only provide bare minimum. So just ask them. You'll find out the differences when you ask the different agencies about that. Okay, next slide. Okay, we're going to jump into rights of the patient and the caregiver because sometimes patients can't speak for themselves and that um, medical power of attorney or that primary caregiver, <coughs> excuse me, is the one making the decision. So um, both parties need to know what their rights are. So the first one is agency choice. Um, the patient has the right to choose which hospice agency they want to use. Okay. Um, the patient has the right to change agencies if they want to. We call it a transfer from agency to agency. There are some limitations on how often a patient can request a transfer, but it is one of the rights that a patient has. The patient also has the right to choose what hospice disciplines see the patient. Um, you're sort of stuck with the nurse, and that's the bare minimum, um, but the patient has the right to refuse the chaplain or aid services if that's not needed or the social worker services if they're not comfortable with that. Um, and of course, we would recommend that to get the full benefit, all the services and 
um, perks, if you will, that um, uh, the patient allow all of those disciplines to see the patient. Um, so when it comes to your spiritual counselors, your chaplains, you might have a clergy person from the patient's faith organization that provides spiritual support and spiritual counseling through visits or phone calls. You know, your pastor, your, uh, your leader of your faith organization, your, um, your Buddhist priest, your monk, etc. But remember that the hospice spiritual counselor, those chaplains have had specialized training in end of life care that possibly the community clergy person doesn't have. So we would really recommend um, embracing all of the different disciplines and seeing what that care would be like. They do have special training. Another right of the patient is do not resuscitate versus full code. We talked about that earlier. A patient does not have to be a DNR to be on hospice. They can be a full code. Another right is what medications and equipment are utilized. So a lot of times um, there is concern about certain medications. Um, patients a lot of times to reduce what we call pill burden where the patient doesn't have to take so many pills, take so much medicine they'll request to drop off medications like vitamins and supplements um, that are so bulky and it just adds to something else that the caregiver has to take care of that the patient has to swallow. Um, some patients also are hesitant to have narcotics in their homes for various reasons. We do use morphine in hospice a lot of times for pain or for shortness of breath, but it's possible that there is concern about a drug diversion in a home or the patient has years of sobriety that they have worked very hard for. And so they don't wanna have narcotics in the home, don't want to use those. It is their right to choose not to have that. When it comes to equipment, um, the patient can, um, you know, take, pay, take equipment that uh, they feel is gonna be useful that will fit in their homes. Certain patients um, don't want certain things. Some people don't want oxygen. Some people are not happy with the idea of a hospital bed being in the home. Um, the presence of a hospital bed, which is kind of bulky and large, um, sends a message about what's happening in the home. Sometimes a hospital bed, um, there's not room for it except in the living room. And so that puts the patient in a very public area of the home. So a patient or a caregiver can choose not to have those pieces of equipment there. The patient can also choose which doctor they'd like to use. So that's one of the myths in hospice that we deal with that, oh, you know, your doctor automatically changes when you move to hospice. That's not true. Your doctor can go with you if the doctor is amenable to that. And the way it works is if your attending physician stays on with you, they collaborate to provide care with the hospice medical director. So you're getting a physician that knows you really well, and then you're also getting the benefit of the hospice medical director who is well-trained and well-experienced in end-of-life care. The patient or the caregiver also has the right to choose where the care is provided, whether it's gonna be in a private home, in a long-term care facility, a nursing home, an assisted living, or even a group home. The patient or the caregiver has the right to start and stop hospice care. In hospice, in the industry, we call it an election when you choose to start the care, and we call it a revocation when you stop the hospice care. You can revoke your hospice. Um, the patient or the caregiver also has the right to make a complaint. And what we would recommend is that you start with the agency. Um, you want to talk, if you're making a complaint about one of your staff or the care that's being provided, you want to talk with the administrator or the director of nurses at the agency. And if they don't satisfy you, things don't improve, it doesn't meet your criteria, you can talk to the accrediting organization. Um, you can also talk to the state organization, Department of Health or Human Services, um, whatever is present in your state. But you should be given those contact numbers on the what we call the election form, which is just a consent to start hospice services. There should be information there about how to make a complaint and contact numbers, who to speak to. It's very good information. Okay, um, next slide. All right, we're gonna talk about the hospice interdisciplinary team, the IDT, 
and the care that each one of these members provide. Um, I'm gonna start and then Jerry's gonna pick up a couple of them. We're gonna start with the registered nurse. So the RN is the one who's going to be doing your assessments of the patient. Um, we do a lot of education, a lot of teaching on disease trajectory. Um, we do a lot of teaching on symptom management and collaborate with the physician quite a bit. Um, the physician is responsible for the orders on the plan of care. The plan of care is all those interventions that we figure out we need to do as a team. Um, so uh, we're meeting the patient's needs. So one of the things that's very mm, unique, I think, about hospice is that there is an interdisciplinary team. And the reason for that is because we feel like it's important to support the whole person. Um, that we are there for each dimension of the patient, body, mind, and spirit. And so the spiritual counselor is available to support the patient and the caregiver's faith beliefs. And the chaplains are trained to be interfaith specialists. We're there to provide that support no matter what the patient or the caregiver's faith beliefs are. And so we're, the chaplains are there to provide counseling, to uh, help with funeral planning and things like that. And the social worker is there also as a uh, counselor of sorts and to help with res resources and referrals. For instance, maybe a patient is in need of a, uh, a provider to be with them and to help with homemaking duties, or maybe they need uh, meals on wheels. And so they're there to help with those resources and to make those referrals for them to provide caregiver support and also patient safety you'll often find the social worker come into a home situation and they'll be looking for safety concerns and things that might need to be uh, changed or fixed so that the home is in a safe place. Next slide, please. All right, um, so some other members of the interdisciplinary team are the hospice aide, and you'll notice the icon for the aide is, uh, she's wearing a little cape, she's the superwoman. Um, and we do have male aides that take care of our patients, but our aides have the most intimate, and I would say the, the most backbreaking physical job out of all the folks on the IDT. They're responsible for bathing our patients, and bathing our patients can look like anything from standby assist with a patient in a shower, all the way to a full bed bath for a patient who is unable to assist or, or even turn themselves or follow instructions. So um, the bathing, the personal care, um, they do catheter care, they do skin care. They also do light housekeeping, tidying and keeping clean the area that um, around and where the patient lives. And I would say that these aides are the unsung hero of the hospice team. These are folks who work in cramped conditions in some of the most difficult environments, you know, keeping a patient warm while they pour sweat to make sure that that patient is comfortable. Because in hospice, we believe that being clean is part of being comfortable and that contributes to quality of life for us. Um, another um, member of the hospice interdisciplinary team that is very unique is the volunteer coordinator and hospice volunteers. So it is a, um, a federal regulation that um, hospice agencies have 5% of their patient care hours come from volunteer services. So we use teams typically have a volunteer coordinator and they recruit and use hospice volunteers. And there's a myriad of different things that a volunteer might be providing for a patient or a family they run errands, they provide companionship, they might walk a dog, uh, you know, help take care of a pet, they might provide music or pet therapy. There are numerous things that they might do. They might read to a patient. Sometimes um, our volunteers just sit to provide presence for a patient as what we call an 11th hour volunteer, which is when a patient is dying and is by themselves by himself. Um, another member of the team is the bereavement coordinator. So Jerry referenced that earlier. We have bereavement services in hospice that follow with our, our families for up to a year after the patient passes away. So we have bereavement coordinators that 
help do those assessments and help set up those services. Um, they pro provide the bereavement care and they also do grief counseling and support. Um, they may do indiv individualized grief counseling. There may be grief support groups. And you know, since the pandemic began, a lot of those have pivoted to virtual groups you know, using Zoom. Um, so there are a lot of different bereavement services that are offered through the bereavement coordinator. Next slide. So these next uh, few members of the team are ones that are not utilized very often. In fact, it's very infrequent that uh, these will be used. However, you need to know about them as well. So the nurse practitioner is one of the members of the team that uh, they are coming out to the home in many cases to do what's called a face-to-face -face visit. So in these face-to-face -face visits, they're coming out to do an assessment of the patient's condition. And their purpose is to many times decide if the patient actually qualifies for hospice or in the case of a recertification. So the patients do have to be recertified as being qualified for hospice on a regular intervals. And before the, that recertification takes place, then they need to have a face-to-face -face visit by either a nurse practitioner or a physician. And in many cases, it's done by the nurse practitioner. So about anywhere from 60 days to 90 days, the nurse practitioner will be coming out to do a face-to-face -face visit. Now, during the pandemic, things have changed a little bit, and sometimes these face-to-face -face visits are actually done virtually. And so they will be talking with the patient or the caregiver and still doing a face-to-face -face visit as an assessment to make sure that the patient still qualifies for hospice care. And then there are therapies that are also available at times when it's needed, uh, physical, occupational speech therapy, uh, including music therapy as well. And so these can be utilized, uh, but it really is up to the physician as well as the agency whether they are needed. Uh, they need to be done, mm, they need to be utilized in cases where it would actually bring an improved quality of life. And so that's usually the criteria that they're looking for. And a dietitian is also sometimes consulted for special dietary needs. So say a patient is having trouble swallowing, the dietitian might be consulted to try to find ways of uh, still being able to feed the patient without it causing trouble for the patient to swallow. Okay, next slide. Okay, so some of the references that uh, we use during this presentation are here available for you, including the one from the uh, the Stanford School of Medicine and the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Uh, we would definitely encourage you to check out the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization website. They have a, uh, a plethora of uh, information that you can use there, as well as the Hospice Foundation of America. They also have uh, resources and information that you can, can find on their website. We would recommend bkbooks.com. This is the website of Barbara Carnes. Barbara Carnes has been in the end of life industry for close to 40 years now. She has a lot of end of life education materials that are good for you to, to read for, all, for families as well as for professionals. And then the Care Compare website that's put out by the um, by CMS. Uh, we, we would want you to take a look at that. And uh, our own website, which is theheartofhospice.com, we would love for you to, uh, to visit us there on that website. Next slide. So we want to thank you today for being a part of this webinar, and we hope that this information has proved very useful for you. And at this point, we'll turn it back over uh, and answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much, Jerry. Um, thank you, Helen. We have lots and lots of questions, so I'd like to get right into it. The first one, I'm going to kind of group a bunch of them into the kind of the, the paying for hospice categories. So some of the questions were um, how much hospice might cost on an average? And then um, in terms of costs, you know, how does Medicare um, fall into that if you have Medicare or if you don't have Medicare? Okay, I'll take that one on. Um, so Medicare and Medicaid both cover hospice. Um, there is a very small copay under the Medicare hospice benefit. Most agencies waive that. So the care is provided 100%, no copay, no charge to the patient at all. 
Medicaid is the same way. There's no charge. There are, um, for private insurance companies, those policies and coverage for hospice will vary from policy to policy. So you would be really smart to go in and talk or you know, talk to your insurance rep or go into the website and look at your own benefits to see. But yes, you're looking at 100% coverage. Thank you, Helen. We've got another question um, about, I guess, finding, um, determining the right the right time for hospice, uh, I guess in general, but also in particular, this listener wanted to know in terms of someone, a uh, family member with dementia. That's always a very difficult one uh, because dementia can be very, um, it's a slow progression. Uh, and so it's gonna be very difficult to do, to, to really determine whether that patient is uh, ready for hospice or not. However, here's what I can tell you. If you contact a hospice agency, they're going to come and do an evaluation of the patient. They're going to be able to determine whether that patient does qualify. And so that's really the best way to find out is when you contact the agency is to, um, to find out from them whether this patient qualifies. There are determining factors that will make that, uh, make that decision for them. So Helen, you have something else. Two of the biggest things that they will look at with a patient that has Alzheimer's or dementia is how well can they walk or can they walk and how much do they talk? Is it reality-based conversations and how many words can they say? So if you have a patient that can talk quite a bit, answer questions and they're very reality-based, that's probably not a, um, a hospice appropriate um, point for that particular patient. Um, you know, typical end-stage Alzheimer's and dementia patients cannot walk on their own. They cannot talk. Um, their diet has had to be modified because they either cannot use utensils or they cannot swallow well. But Jerry's right, the hospice agency will look and be able to tell you for sure what the criteria is and if your, your person, your loved one meets the criteria. Thank you. Um, and another question for Helen. I was going to answer this in chat, but I want to make sure I didn't give the incorrect answer. But could you just briefly explain the difference between um, you had on on one of the um, kind of rights and uh, the rights section? You have the right for the spectrum between a DNR and a, a full code. Could you just explain briefly what full code is? A full code is, I guess, the easiest way to do, describe it with with a patient that's in the home is that 911 emergency services are called, CPR is initiated, medications are given intravenously, there are chest compressions, um, the patient is ventilated, you know, bagged. Um, so it's a full code, quote unquote, out in the home is the use of CPR. And once that's activated and that process starts, the paramedics are working on the patient, then that process continues when a patient is moved to the emergency room and into the hospital. So full code is really two very simple words for a very big process, but it's basically saying that there are chest compressions and artificial ventilation that is started. Great, thank you. We've got another question actually about the rating systems. I know you mentioned the, um, the care compare tool are there any other um, maybe alternatives for trying to determine, you know, kind of relative quality of agencies that are maybe a little bit more, um, more recent? Unfortunately, no, there is not anything publicly available. Um, Care Compare is, is fairly young. Um, it hasn't been around that long. And unfortunately the refinement of that process has not gotten us the most current information but I would tell you to look at the agencies in your area, ask um, how often they see patients, what disciplines are there, do they have music therapy, some of these more enriched, not just the basic therapies. Um, that's one of the disadvantages to care compare. There is no star rating for it quite yet. Um, all of that is in process and in planning from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services but that is the most current ones. That is the most current one we have right now. We would really recommend more than anything, uh, word of mouth. Ask friends, ask family, um, give you probably the, the best recommendations uh, rather than Care Compare. But right now, Care Compare is 
is really the only thing that we have available. Great, thank you. And actually, I have a, uh, a question for you, Jerry. Um, I think more. Um, this is relating to the kind of um, the help provided on the actual time of death. So they're wondering what um, you mentioned it, but they're kind of wondering a little bit more in detail in terms of maybe like certifying the death, you know, arranging for a cremation or a burial, you know, funeral arrangements, things of that nature. Yeah, advanced care planning is something that's going to be very important to do. And so if there hasn't been any advanced care planning done before the patient enters into hospice, then the hospice team will begin um, introducing some of these uh, realities, if you will, into very, uh, you know, very mm, softly, very gently, but we'll be introducing some of these realities and asking, you know, what, what do you want? If the patient's still able to, uh, to express their wishes, then we're gonna be asking, what is it that, that you want? Uh, do you want a regular, you know, formal burial, a formal funeral or memorial service? Do you want cremation? Uh, and then begin making some of those decisions and helping them to make those decisions. We want them to express their wishes more than anything. And so um, advanced care planning becomes very, very important. And the team will begin to, to talk about those things with the, the patient and the caregiver and the family. Was there something else about that question that, that I missed? No, I think that's, um, yeah, that's perfect. Um, we have another question um, actually, two related questions, kind of on the um, the criteria for hospice in terms of that the, that six month kind of um, prognosis or expectancy of someone's um, life expectancy. Um, one person wanted to know, kind of, I guess, more in general, how is it determined with some of these more um, ambiguous or not ambiguous, but some of these conditions that that are a little bit more unsure, maybe like ALS or MS, things that are kind of long term. And then also a listener who had heard that the six month life expectancy is not necessarily the only factor considered these days. I, I'll take that one, Calvin. Um, so the first one, um, how, you know, how is it determined uh, life expectancy six months or less? Um, it is difficult. Um, <laughs> I have a physician friend who will tell you that um, determining life expectancy is um, an art, not a science. And there are tools that are utilized that physicians use. There are um, scales and tools that we use. A FAST scale is used in dementias and Alzheimer's. Um, we also use um, what we call the PPS or Karnofsky scales, and it has to do with functional abilities. Um, but all of that is determined by a physician. We also look at where the patient has been going in the last year, how their condition has changed, how many times have they had to utilize the emergency room or a hospital stay, how many infections have they had. Um, if it's a cancer patient, we look at does the patient um, no longer want to pursue treatment or is no longer responsive to treatment? Um, I hope that answers the first question. Um, would you repeat the second question for me, Calvin, please? Sure. The second question is someone who wanted to, um, or someone who had heard actually that the six month, let me just look at it one more time again, that the six month kind of prog um, prognosis is not necessarily the only factor being considered. So is there any kind of wiggle room on that six months or is really the six month a hard, uh, you know, that is that really a hard, um, hard number, the six months? No, it, it's not really a hard and fast rule. Um, it is something that we look at um, in the terminology for hospice care. A physician is certifying a patient as being terminally ill, and that is defined by a six-month life expectancy. However, we do have patients in hospice that live longer than six months. And if a patient gets to that six-month mark and they are still appropriate for hospice, we recertify them and the care continues. Um, that is just basically, um, I would say, a, a bookkeeping thing on the part of the hospice agency. Um, that's part of the regulatory requirement that we have. Um, but we look at all of these things, all of the conditions of the patient, the trajectory, things, their, their recent health history, and all of that gets added up 
to create a six month life expectancy, yeah, six month expectancy for life. Um, but again, it's not a hard and fast rule. You don't just get cut off immediately at six months. Great, thanks. I think we have time actually just for two more questions. We have one listener who um, looks like they have a family member who's already um, using a hospice uh, service. Their question is though, they're having a little bit of trouble between the hospice, um, the nurse, registered nurse, I guess, and the, um, the elder care facility registered nurse. Um, so there's a little bit of, it sounds like there's a little bit of a delay in communication more than they think is, um, more than they would like. So in general, I guess, how often would you expect a, a well or a smooth running team? How often would you think of those two team members communicating? And I guess, again, if, um, if there are maybe hiccups or they feel that the care is unsatisfactory, um, what might be some steps they should consider? Well, first of all, for a patient that's in a facility, every time, every single time that one of the hospice disciplines goes out to see the patient, they should be communicating with that caregiver. It's very much important these days because a lot of facilities are restricting visitation and the only folks who are getting in are the hospice team. So that communication between the hospice team members and the family member or primary caregiver um, is super important. For nurses, I would expect them to communicate and coordinate with the facility nurse or assisted living facility nurse every single time they make a visit. That care coordination is important. It's required by regulation. And it is a right of that patient and that caregiver to know that that care coordination is happening and the communication flows back to them. So if you're having trouble with the communication, you don't see it happening, there's a delay or there's a discrepancy between who's telling you what, my suggestion is that you speak to the director of nurses for the facility and you speak to the director of nurses or the administrator for the hospice agency and say, this is what we see. We would like for this to be better and here's what we would expect. And remember, you have the right to make a complaint. And if they do not satisfy you, you have the right to change agencies to get an improved quality of care. Perfect, thanks. Um, I think, yeah, we just have one last question. Hopefully this is not too much of an open-ended question, but you know, we've all been living with this, um, this pandemic for almost a year now. In terms of hospice care for those, I guess, I guess both looking into, you know, looking to um, use a hospice service, but also those who are already, um, um, already using it. What are some of the challenges and some of the considerations that, um, that COVID, that um, people need to keep in mind in terms of um, COVID and hospice care? Not, sorry, not necessarily for someone with COVID, but uh, just in this environment of COVID-19, what are, what are some of the ways these have changed? I know um, you and Jerry have brought up something like, you know, more video calls, but are there any other um, considerations or concerns, things people should keep in mind? A lot of it depends on where the patient is located. Are they in the facility? Because the facilities will often re refuse to have um, people come in, even the hospice staff. They'll, they will refuse to have the hospice staff come into the facility, and for good reason, because the more, mm, the more people you have coming into the facility, the more likely there is for transmission of the virus. And so they won't, let that, they won't let the hospice team come in. So what we do in that case is we try to provide the care from a distance virtually. Uh, we'll try to do what we can to either uh, speak to the patient directly if, they're, if we're able to do that through uh, either a telephone, through, um, through a, you know, some kind of video chat or something like that. We'll try to do that as well. If they're at home, and the, the patient and the family are agreeable to having the team come to the home, uh, obviously using you know, good mm, protections and using you know, uh, the, the required PPE, including masks, gloves, things like that, then uh, we would certainly do that if they want us to, to make those visits in the home. And we, all, we always take the precautions that are necessary. Uh, we're even, making sure that we don't bring anything unnecessary into the home, no unnecessary equipment, uh, whether it be even a stethoscope or you know, a, a book. Uh, we only bring in what's absolutely necessary because anything else that we bring in 
it just increases the possibility of transmission. And so we want to avoid that at all, at all possible. Perfect. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Helen and Jerry. Uh, we'd like to thank our audience, of course, for participating this afternoon. These webinars are um, free. You can view uh, information about our next one at caregiver.org. I'd like to thank again our, um, our, great ho our, our great presenters today, Helen Bauer and Jerry Fenter. Thank you so much, Gavin. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, we hope to see you on the next one. I've just launched a quick poll, so feel free to um, share your, um, your feedback. We'd love to hear back from you. But otherwise, uh, I think that's the end for this one. And I'd just like to wish you all um, a safe and uh, safe, safe afternoon and everyone to take care.